There are just a few of us here at Oak Hill who are old enough to remember the Watergate scandal. It took place in this decade called the early 70s. Um, and I vividly remember it as a kid, mainly because my family was glued to the television, black and white TV with the rabbit ear antennas on it, uh, glued to the television 24-7 because the con congressional hearings were taking place. And all I knew as a kid was, this is so boring. Where are my TV shows, right? But I remember it very, very well. Now I realize, of course, how unprecedented that whole episode was. The stunning removal of a U.S. president from office. And whether you agreed with him or not politically, it was hard not to see that it was a very sad spectacle in the history of our country. Um, sad for us as a nation, but then to imagine how humiliating it was for Richard Nixon and his wife, Pat, and all they went through. One day, think about this, you're the most powerful man in the entire world. You have this massive team of security agents that take care of you. You have a staff of hundreds of people at your beck and call. You live in a mansion. It's got to be one of the biggest mansions in the world, right? You have your own private jumbo jet, your own jet. You have your own helicopter for short trips around the city. You have a fleet of specially designed limousines. You have a private retreat for you and your family. You have basically anything that you could ask for. Every word you're, that you speak, the, the entire world just holds its breath to listen to what you have to say. You command the most powerful military on the earth. And in the next day, it's gone. It is literally gone, just like that. You resign in disgrace. Your legacy is tarnished. Your reputation in shambles. You're forced out of the public eye. Nobody cares a lick anymore about what you have to say about anything. You give up your mansion and your staff and your helicopter and all those perks. Everything is gone. And your life is completely unraveled and you're left in humiliation and disgrace. That's all. Nothing big, right? Well, King David would have understood Richard Nixon because he went through something very similar in the year 980 B.C., a very similar type of humiliation. And you, you might even say it was worse because the source behind his downfall, his resignation, was his own rebellious son. Think about that. At this point in history, David had become famous and powerful in the ancient Near East. He had reigned in Israel for decades. His military victories were legendary. He had extended Israel's borders to the largest it had ever been. Personally, he'd become very wealthy. He had built this luxurious palace for himself in Jerusalem. He had taken wives and concubines. He had more servants than he could even number. But then that day came. We all know the story. When he got lazy and he took his eyes off the ball, right? He let his guard down and he sinned against Bathsheba. And then on top of that, on top of his sexual depravity, he added premeditated murder in taking care of her husband. And although we read about the story of, of David repenting, right, when Nathan comes and confronts him, genuinely repenting, his wicked choices set in motion a whole chain of events that brought about devastating consequences in his life and in the life of his family. And David soon found his entire life, everything he had built, unraveling in a moment. So what do you do? What do you do when your life starts to fall apart? When you feel like things are, are spinning and you, you're out of control and you're not sure when the next shoe's going to drop and you just, you're flustered. What do I do now, Lord? Well, in the midst of his trouble, you know what David did? He sat down and he wrote poems. He wrote songs expressing his heart to the Lord. And the great news is we have them in our Bibles today that we can read. So grab your Bibles. If you haven't opened already, let's go to Psalm 3. So the first of the five collections of the Psalms in the entire book are almost exclusively written by David. And Psalm 3 is the official beginning of what we call the Davidic collection that runs all the way through Psalm 41. And as you get there in your Bible, Psalm 3, you'll see that this one does have a title, or what we call a superscription. Remember, Psalms 1 and 2 did not. Psalm 3 is titled, A Psalm of David When He Fled from Absalom, His Son. 
So what we're going to do this morning is cover the highlights of this psalm plus Psalms 4 and 5 because they share connecting threads that I think we can learn from. And here's the great thing about the psalms. If you know a little bit about the background that they're written in, they're really not hard to understand. It doesn't take a lot of technical understanding to look and interpret the psalms. They're not difficult. But they are an absolute goldmine when it comes to helping us understand the realities of life, especially when things get difficult, when we're in a storm and we're feeling flustered, especially as it relates to prayer and worship. So let's start by talking about the backdrop. What is happening as we look at Psalms 3, 4, and 5? Well, the story, by the way, it's in 2 Samuel chapters 15 to 18. If you've never read this story of David's downfall, it is a great read. It is worth your time. 2 Samuel 15 to 18. The story starts not with Absalom, but with another son of David. His name is Amnon. And I'm going to put just a really abbreviated family tree on the screen so you can see who the players are. Basically, the players in this drama come out of two of David's eight wives that are named in the Bible. Okay, so you can see that as we go along. Amnon, we're told, harbored a deep love for Tamar. And as we're going to find out, a a really wicked lust for his half-sister, Tamar. So much so that he arranged at one point after Tamar had shut him down and repelled his advances, he arranged, premeditated a situation where he could rape Tamar. And he did so. And then he put her out of his house in disgrace. And Absalom, who was Tamar's full brother, harbored a great hatred for his half-brother Amnon because of this. He was rightly furious about what had happened. And so he took his sister in to live with him. And for the next two years, Absalom plotted revenge against Amnon. Eventually, he lured lured him to a party in the middle of the celebration. In front of all the other sons of David, Absalom had his servants kill Amnon in cold blood. He got his revenge. And then fearing his father's wrath, Absalom fled north across the Jordan to a place called Gesher, where he stayed for three years. Now, we're told in the Bible that David longed to go out to Absalom. That's what the text says. But he didn't do anything to actually go out and reconcile the relationship. It was finally David's general and right-hand man, Joab, who was responsible for bringing Absalom back to Jerusalem. But even then, he was not allowed in the presence of the king. Things were not reconciled. For the next few years, no doubt resenting his father's handling of this whole situation, Absalom decided to undermine his own father, to undermine the kingship of the great King David. And he went around Jerusalem courting all the important disgruntled people that lived in God's kingdom. He offered, offered them a more sympathetic ear as a king and began to make promises to say, if you'll just crown me king, I will do much more for you than my father David. And guess what happened? Absalom's father, followers grew steadily, steadily. So much so that David began to fear not just for his kingship, but for his life. 2 Samuel 15 says this, the conspiracy was strong. For the people increased continually with Absalom. And there came a messenger to David. Can you imagine getting this message saying, the hearts of the men of Israel are after Absalom. Your own son, your own flesh and blood. Once he felt strong enough, Absalom made his move. It was very symbolic. He went to Hebron, which is the very same place where David had been crowned king after Saul's death. And he assembled his followers. He had himself anointed as the new king of Israel. And then with a considerable army behind him, he began to strategize how he could chase down and destroy his father. David, surveying the reality of the situation, doing the math, hearing about the hearts of the men of Israel, gathered all those closest to him, and they fled the palace in Jerusalem. And they headed towards the wilderness to try to find safety. Guys, you cannot even fathom what a shocking development this is. The great King David of Israel, the greatest king Israel had ever known, is forced to flee his city, the city of David, in shame. 2 Samuel 15 says this, And David went up the ascent of the Mount of Olives, and he wept as he went. And his head was covered, and he walked barefoot, the king. Then all the people who were with him each covered his head and went up weeping as they went. This was traumatic. This was humiliating. Everything David had had built was coming apart, 
Imagine having all these people, former allies, men that you had fought with, now joining the coup against you, lining up behind Absalom. And of course, the most painful wound of all is it was his own son that had plotted this treachery. When Absalom entered Jerusalem and found that his father was gone, he solidified his position. He moved in to the king's palace. He took David's concubines for himself. And then he began to plot about how to pursue his father and attack him. Meanwhile, David also crossed the Jordan, and he was able to regroup with his commander, Joab, to scrape together a a small fighting force of loyal followers. And across the Jordan, in the wilderness, they now waited for Absalom and his army to come for them. That's what's going on as David writes Psalm 3. So let's talk about his state of mind. You have to understand, this is no longer the shepherd boy, right? Out fighting off lions with a stick. This is no longer David the teenager who'd become a national hero in killing Goliath. And this was not the young, vibrant king who had had success after success, driving back the Philistines and wiping out the Ammonites. David was now an older man. He is in his early 60s. Super relatable for me. And here he was, after all of this, lying down to sleep out in the wilderness, far from the luxury of his palace. The ripple effect of his sins had led to one daughter being raped, one son being murdered, and now a second son seeking to kill him. So if you're David, what do you do now? Put yourself in those sandals. What do you do now? I know that some of you here this morning, you have a small inkling of what David was feeling in that moment. Certainly you didn't go through an exact situation like this or maybe not to this level, but you've seen a few things in your life. You've had some choppy waters in various seasons of your life and you can feel this a little bit, right? You should be able to feel this. A particular loss that you suffered or a defeat, a public humiliation of some kind, an embarrassing failure, the loss of a business, a marriage that ended in divorce, Maybe you had a friend or a family member who turned against you, betrayed you, lies and gossip spoken about you, brought harm to your reputation. There are many, many possibilities where we can in some small way identify with David here. And having to endure all those types of things, they can cause you to doubt your faith, can't they? They can cause you to doubt whether God really loves you, whether he is caring for you. You can begin to question whether you're useful in the kingdom anymore because of what you've gone through so far. And and when that happens, you know what the enemy does? He wants to reinforce all of those lies. He wants to tell you. He wants to show you your past and say, you're no longer useful. God doesn't really care for you, right? Reinforcing the false idea that you're not worthy of God's love and that you're beyond recovery. Some of you guys have gone through this. I know I've suffered from these seasons in my life as, as well where real difficulty is coming in my life, even in ministry. And listen, for those of you who haven't gone through anything like this and you're like, I don't think I can feel this, your time will probably come when you will have to go through something this hard. And so it's really important for all of us to know when those times come, how do we respond? And David David helps us to see that so well in the Psalms. This really is the value of the Psalms, especially these three we're looking at this morning. So let's go back to the question. What do you do when life unravels? What do you do? What's the fleshly response when life starts to get really hard? Well, first we take stock of our own personal resources and see if we can wiggle our way out of it. That's usually our first response. Then we put up defensive measures in place, and then we plot how we can counterattack or take vengeance against our enemies. That's the fleshly response. But David shows us another way. Now, don't get me wrong. He didn't ignore the practical things that he needed to do, like raising an army. (laughs) You You can't just sit on the couch and just expect everything to happen for you. You do have to take practical steps. But the Psalms tell us where David's priority was. His first head and heart direction that he has. And that's towards prayer and towards worship and towards faith. Prayer, worship, and faith. David knew in this moment he had to turn to Yahweh. He had to cry out for his help because that was the only way he was going to come out on top. Listen, the odds were against him in this situation. And he knew. He was desperate. He knew he needed Yahweh's help if he was going to come out on top. So look at Psalm 3, verse 1. 
O Lord, how my adversaries have increased. Many are rising up against me. Many are saying of my soul, there's no deliverance for him in God. So you feel it here, right? David, David knows that things are snowballing against him. And this, is, this can happen in an insurrection or a coup when suddenly it feels like just everybody is joining. It's like a social contagion. David knows things are snowballing fast. How awful it must have been to lay his head down in the wilderness and to think of all of his former friends lining up behind Absalom. And in verse 2, you see that David had become aware of the vicious words that were being thrown around about his spiritual condition. This had to hurt. God wants no part of him, his enemies were saying. God wants no part of him. He's done. There is no delivering him now, was the gossip going around Jerusalem. No doubt in mind, they had in mind the, the affair with Bathsheba, the whispers of how David was a failure as a father and a king. The hypocrite, they must have said hypocrite. How can he claim to follow Yahweh? How can he claim to be the king of Israel with all that in his past? And by the way, we're not going to sugarcoat, sugarcoat his sins, right? They were very, very serious. But you have to understand, these psalms that we're looking at today, they only tell a part of the story. Trust me, we'll get to the psalms where David shows his repentant heart. This is just a snapshot. But where David's enemies are wrong is in declaring that they knew that God was somehow unwilling to forgive him. This is so important. They were mistaken in declaring that David had been abandoned by Yahweh because his sins were too great. Do you hear that clearly? These guys looked at David's life and said, that's too much sin to forgive. There is no deliverance for him. That's, that's a lie from the pit of hell, isn't it? But you get a sense here that, yeah, these words had gotten under David's skin. He mentions them right here in verse 2. And again, this is what the enemy wants to do, constantly throwing this stuff back in your face, right? We cannot let him do it. We cannot say that anyone is beyond forgiveness, beyond deliverance, if our hearts are repentant. Turn over to Psalm 4 now. We'll see something very similar in verse 1. Psalm 4, 1. David says, answer me when I call. O God of my righteousness, you have relieved me in my distress. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. So you hear the, the passion in this, the desperation. Please answer me, Lord. I need you. Nobody's ever accused David of having a boring prayer life. He's very expressive. He's very emotional. And it's a great inspiration for us. We should all be as quick to turn to prayer as David was and to be just as authentically passionate when we come before the throne of grace. Now listen, it's not that we persuade God by being overly emotional. God can't be manipulated that way. So it's not the emotion that gets God's attention, but God wants us to be genuine and expressive as we commune with him, as we would with any person who is close to us. So if we come all formal all the time, God's like, look, I know you better than that. Tell me about what's happening. I want you to be genuine and expressive. I want you to be real and honest. God wants us to care deeply about the things that he cares about. And we express those things in prayer. Proverbs 15, 8 says, the prayer of the upright is his delight. He delights when those who love him, who are upright, come and pray. Now, the other important thing to see in the psalm, look in verse 1 again. David calls Yahweh God of my righteousness. And there's a beautiful recognition in that. David is acknowledging right here, I am righteous, but my righteousness, it's not mine. I didn't, I didn't produce this in, my, in myself. It comes through you, Yahweh, by your grace. Because at this point, listen, David is, David is very, very aware of how his sins have hurt so many. But the Lord has declared David still to be righteous in his sight. This is literally New Testament, what we call justification by faith alone. Here in the Old Testament, David says, you're the God of my righteousness. I don't have that. That came by your grace. Turn over to Psalm 5 now. We'll see a few other really important principles. Psalm 5, 1. Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my groaning. Heed the sound of my cry for help, my King and my God, for to you I pray. 
In the morning, O Lord, you will hear my voice. In the morning, I will order my prayer to you and eagerly watch. So here we see David's passion being amped up even more. He's using, again, what we call synonymous parallelism to repeat the same request over and over again. Father, incline your ear to me. I need you. I'm groaning in pain right now, he says. Please, Lord, hear the sound of my cry. And there's so much just in these three verses, Psalm 5, 1 to 3, that if we put even some of this into practice, we would see such fruitful results in our prayer lives. I'll give you a whole list of them. First of all, there's persistency, right? In the morning, in the morning, first thing, Lord, because you are my priority, you are my first love. So before I think about anything else, what's happening in my job or, or what's on Twitter or anything like that, first, Lord, I will come to you persistently. Second, there's David's honesty. He's like, I'm groaning here, Father. He's, right, he's not faking it. He's not holding back. He's not trying to frame his words to sound really good before God. He's just raw. Lord, I'm in distress here. So he's honest. And then you see how personal it is. He calls God my king and my God. David was no stranger in God's presence. So even though he understood that Yahweh was high and lifted up and infinite in every way, he speaks to him like a friend would speak to another. It's very personal. Fourth, you see here David's prayers organized. It says he orders his prayers. What does that mean? I think we're all guilty of this sometimes. David doesn't just wander aimlessly into prayer like, well, what should I say today? Right? He orders it. He, he has purpose as he comes to, to prayer. He's concentrated. He's focused. Lord, here are my needs. So he orders those things. And then finally, he prays expectantly. Like that watchman that's posted on the wall. In the ancient world, you posted a watchman to, to see when the messenger was returning with news. David says, look, I order my prayer, I lay it before you, and then I watch expectantly. So listen, all of these things raise questions about, about your prayer life. And you know what? In my prayer life, one of, my, one of the things I'm most looking forward to in the Psalms is my own heart in prayer, improving my prayer life. And, and, I, and I'm sure you're thinking the same thing with Psalms. But a bunch of questions are raised here about your prayer habits. Are you persistent in praying for the things that matter most? Over and over again, are you persistent? Would you describe your prayer life as completely open and honest and raw before the Lord? Or do you hold back? Isn't that funny that we would do that? We would hold back from an omniscient God? But we do. Are you a stranger in God's presence? Or is that just a, a familiar part of your day, a familiar posture? Do you pray with purpose? Or do you just sort of wander in and out of prayer, fall asleep, Lose focus. Do you pray and then just move on? Like, okay, check that box, move on with my day, but you're not watching, not paying attention to how God might be responding. So these are all important Christian disciplines in our life. And, and, and we all need to improve in this. There's not one person here that would raise their hand and go, my prayer life is super vibrant and I, it's exactly where I want it to be. But if you need help with this, ask somebody. So the first thing that we see in the Psalms here is how quickly and naturally David turns to prayer. It is so beautiful to see. But then the next question to ask, ask is this. What does he believe about the nature of God as he prays? What does he believe about God? That's important, right? If you're going to go and speak to this, to this infinite being, what do you believe about him? Well, look at Psalm 3 again. Let's go back there. Psalm 3, verse 3. And we see three things that David declares about God here. He says, but you, O Lord, are, number one, a shield about me. Number two, my glory. And number three, the one who lifts my head. Now, that language about being a shield is very, very ancient in Hebrew literature. In fact, it predates David by a thousand years or more. This goes all the way back to Genesis 15, when God said the same thing to Abraham, I am a shield about you. This is a common theme with the Lord. And then David uses similar language in Psalm 5. I'll put it up on the screen so you can see it. But I want you to see all the language about this idea of a protective covering. God desires to be a protective covering, a shield about his people. Psalm 5.11 says, But let all who take refuge in you. What does it mean to take refuge? Refuge is like going into a cave in the storm. I take refuge from that storm. 
right? Let all who take refuge in you be glad. Let them ever sing for joy. May you shelter them that those who love your name may exult in you. For it is you who blesses the righteous man, O Lord. You surround him with favor as with a shield. That language is so beautiful and it should be a comfort to us that our God, our infinite God, looks down and knows you by name and wants to be your shelter. And of course, this is exactly what David needed, right, in this moment. A protector and a defender because his enemies were coming for him in this moment. Now, just because you have a shield doesn't mean that the enemy stops firing arrows at you. And that's important to notice. This is not a get-out-of-jail-free card. The enemy will keep shooting arrows at you, but your shield means that they're not going to land, meaning they're not going to separate you from God's love. That's really what that shield is, right? The shield doesn't stop all the trouble from happening. It just says that the arrows can't land and you won't be separated from God's love, that nothing is going to happen to you outside of what his will is. His sovereignty. And that's a great peace and a comfort, right, as the storms of life surround us. The second thing David says in Psalm 3.3 is that the Lord is his glory, which is his way of saying, I have no glory of my own. Really a humble statement from a king like David. You're my glory. I don't have glory of my own. I have no glory apart from what Yahweh has done through me. We all need to get to that point, right, so we don't get puffed up with pride. Only what God has done through me. So he is my joy, he is my boast, and he is my glory. David acknowledges that. And then obviously it's David's desire that at some point the Lord is going to vindicate him before his enemies and that he's going to restore his dignity and his honor as king in Israel. So he says, Lord, you're the one who lifts up my head. Now we understand this phrase in English. When somebody is dejected and depressed, what do we say? Oh, he's hanging his head right? In shame. Oh, he's just down, downcast, right? Well, Yahweh is the one who lifts our head up when we feel down and defeated. When we stop relying upon ourselves and turn to him in prayer, he's the one. This is so important. He is the one when we turn to him. Now, if we just, if we just duck our head and walk around like Eeyore all the time, we're going to be Eeyores. But when we come to him in prayer, he lifts our head and he says, take a look at the truth. The truth is you're still loved, you're still cared for. I've washed away your sins. Get up and be useful. So he lifts our head. He vindicates us. Is that not beautiful? That God is these three things, a shield, your glory, and the one who lifts your head in the midst of difficulty. Then there's one last thing to see here in Psalm 3. Look at verse 4. Psalm 3, 4 says, I was crying to the Lord with my voice. He answered me from his holy mountain. I lay down and slept. I awoke for the Lord sustains me. I will not be afraid of 10,000s of people who have set themselves against me round about. How badly do we want the peace of the Lord in our lives? This, I mean, in this crazy world we live in, tell me you're not yearning for peace. This is it right here. Look how confident David is in these verses. Confident that God has heard his requests. Confident that God had already answered. Sovereignty, right? And so confident that he's able to lie down and sleep like a baby in the midst of this nightmare. That's cool. And remember, he's not in the palace on satin sheets and a fluffy pillow. He is literally sleeping on the very ground in which he's about to have to fight for his life. And he sleeps like a baby. And then he wakes without fear. He knows tens of thousands of people are coming for him. And it says he wakes without fear. Tell me if this isn't true. Sleep is a blessing. (laughs) I knew I'd get an amen out of that one. Sleep is a blessing. We need it. God knows we need it. It's a physical need in us. Here's the thing. I have found this to be true, man. Uh, uh, Moment of transparency. You can fool all kinds of people that your life is just squared away and everything's fine and there's not a worry in the world, but late at night, you can't fool your own heart. I'm convinced that it's late at night, lying in your bed when you are most vulnerable to the attacks of the enemy, to sort of stir up worry and anxiety in your hearts. You are vulnerable at that time. 
So when you're under a great amount of pressure, being able to lay your head down on the pillow in peace, that is an amazing gift. But you got to ask for it. You got to ask God for that. You got to rely on his promises. You got to read the scriptures. You got to come to this realization that he's sovereign. You've got to preach the gospel to yourself, lay your head down, and rest in peace. Right? Be anxious for nothing, Paul said. We, we all know Philippians, right? Philippians 4. Be anxious for nothing. Right? In all things, do what? Lay your request before the Lord, right? It doesn't say just feel better about it. Be anxious for nothing by bringing your prayers and requests before the Lord, and he will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. We sometimes skip the step about praying, but that's what God says. Or meditate on what Paul says in Romans 8. If God is for us, who can be against us, right? And then he goes on to say, look, even if we're sheep for slaughter, he says we overwhelmingly conquer because of the one who's loved us. So we can't lose. I think that's what David is dealing with here. He's sleeping like a baby because he knows he can't lose because God loves him and God's a a shield around him. So why would we fear? Why would we not lay our heads down in peace? It's something we got to battle for. If you struggle with this, with worry, anxiety, especially late at night in your bed, this is something you've got to struggle and strive for. But God can provide that peace. Now, lest you think prayer is just passive, I also want you to see in the Psalms how David goes to God and requests that God take action on his behalf. Stay there in Psalm 3 and look at verses 7 and 8. There it is. Psalm 3, 7 and 8. Arise, O Lord, save me, O God. For you have smitten all my enemies on the cheek. You have shattered the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be upon your people. Now, the language here is intentional and important. Remember back in, one, back in verse 1, David said, Many of my enemies are rising up against me. Well, David takes that same Hebrew verb, which is kum, and he asks Yahweh to rise up on his behalf. My enemies are rising up. Arise, O Lord. Defend me, my king and my God. He's using a military phrase here. Arise, O Lord. It's the Lord of hosts, right? Yahweh Sabaoth, Lord of hosts. Go and fight my battles for me. I cannot win this. I don't have the resources to win this fight. So arise, O Lord, and deliver me. And then in verse, back in verse 2, remember David's enemy said, there's no deliverance for him. Well, the, David takes that same language here and asks the Lord to do exactly that. Deliver me, save me, O Lord. So my enemies are saying this, but I'm asking God to do it for me. Take action for me, Lord. It's a direct rebuke against his enemies. The language is it's sort of a wordplay here. And then notice how David pictures his adversaries like ravenous beasts who are baring their teeth, ready to devour him. And look how he declares their demise. Look at the tense of the verb here. You have smitten all my enemies. You have shattered their teeth. It's done. David speaks of it as if it's done. Right? And this is a familiar pattern for David in how he prays. What he does is he speaks of God's past mercies in his life as a reason to hope for God acting in the present. God, you've been faithful in the past to do these things. I know you'll be faithful now. And so he prays with great certainty, right? And I will say, um, as an old guy, this is one of those advantages of being an older person or having a longer walk with the Lord. There's more things to look back on. I have more failures than most of you, (laughs) right? I've, I've fought more battles than most of you. But there's been so much grace in that process. So I can look back on these things and I can think, God, in the moment it was so hard, but you pulled me through and I learned so much and you grew me through that. And now I have all these things to look back at and say, Lord, why would I not trust you now in the present battle? So what do you think of that time that God brought you through a hard time? Or he kept you from going down the wrong path. Let those moments increase your confidence in prayer. Lord, you've been faithful before. I know you'll be my my shield and my glory now. Amen? Amen. And then turn over to Psalm 5. We'll see just a little bit more of this. There it is. (laughs) Psalm 5.4. For you are not a God who takes pleasure in wickedness. No evil dwells with you. 
The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all who do iniquity. You destroy those who speak falsehood. The Lord abhors the man of bloodshed and deceit. This is, this is one of the reasons why David can be so confident. This is so important. First of all, he is confident that his heart is aligned with Yahweh. In spite of his past sins, he knows that to be true. He knows that he's been cleansed of that sin. He's repented and been washed and that he's now walking in an upright fashion with the Lord. We need to have that confidence, that clean conscience when we come to the Lord in prayer, right? That we have confessed sin, that we've truly repented, and we can know that we've been cleansed. But then David contrasts that with his enemies. And what does he do? He appeals to God as the righteous judge. Judge between me and my enemies, he says. Because his enemies are so evil, he expects that God is going to act on his behalf. That's so important. Now drop down to verse 10. What does he actually ask the Lord to do? Hold them guilty, O God. Hold them guilty. This is imprecatory, isn't it? And what, what's required in an imprecatory prayer is, first of all, your own heart to be aligned with Yahweh, right? Before you, before you ask God to judge anyone, take that, that log out of your eye. But if you've cleaned that log out, you can say, hold them guilty, O God. By their own devices, let them fall. Now, now, to some of us, that language is kind of surprising because it's a little uncomfortable. And we always think of the, what's the one verse in the New Testament you think about that maybe looks like it might contradict this. What does Jesus say in the Sermon on the Mount? Love your enemies and pray for them. But David says, no, hold them guilty. So how do we reconcile this? Well, who was Jesus speaking to in the Sermon on the Mount? His followers. And guess what? It's true. We're not to take vengeance against our enemies. That is not our role to play. We're to forgive. We're to pray for. Right? Paul wrote in Romans 12, Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it's written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. And that's what David is doing. David is not saying, Lord, give me permission to pour out your wrath on them. He's not asking for permission to destroy his enemies. What's he doing? He's appealing to God and saying, Lord, you know the hearts of these people. You know them, just as you know my heart. They are an affront to you, right? They are an affront to your rule. So you, Lord, hold them accountable. All he's doing is is asking God to pay the wicked back for what they deserve, He's not asking to be judge and executioner. And that's a really important distinction. Does that make sense? Very important. Listen, in my experience in ministry, I'll give you my personal testimony here. I've experienced a few things in ministry that, uh, again, just a sliver of what David felt here where, where people I thought were good friends turned on me and betrayed me, where I was hurt badly in ministry. Um, where professing Christians rose up and attacked the church, attacked the bride of Christ. I've experienced that before, and it's devastating. You can't imagine how you're going to get through it. But when that happens, here's what I've learned. And I've, you can ask Tanya, I was never always good at this, but I, I've learned. I've learned to pray in one of two ways. I ask God to either be glorified in showing my enemies their sin, and correcting them and bringing them to repentance, or two, I've asked God to judge them and discipline them as he sees fit, not as I do. Because I can't control it, and I'm not sovereign. And I can't know God's sovereign purposes in the conflict that I'm in, so I leave that in the hands of the Lord. And I lay my head down on the pillow, and I sleep in peace. It's hard. It's really hard. Some of you guys, you've been in conflict, maybe in the church, maybe outside the church. It's hard to just give that to the Lord and say, it's not my fight. It's not my fight. The Lord will fight that battle. And his will will be done, always. And his judgment will always be just. Amen? So before I wrap up, what's the PS to the story about Absalom and David? Did the battle take place? It did. Did God act on David's behalf? He did. Absalom's forces came for David and they crossed the Jordan and they fought a battle in this place known as the Forest of Ephraim. And the Lord was with David's army that day. 
2 Samuel 18 says, the slaughter was great. Some 20,000 of Absalom's men were killed in battle. And David won the day. God was good and gracious to him. And in spite of David's instructions, he literally told his generals, deal gently with my son Absalom. They didn't. And his rebellious son met a very unflattering death. You probably know the story. As he's riding through the forest in the battle, he gets his long hair tangled up in a branch and it dislodges him from his, his mule. And he is literally stuck, it says, hanging between heaven and earth by his hair, unable to free himself. And a soldier comes back to David's camp and says, I saw Absalom, he's hanging in a tree. And what did Joab do? And Joab went against David's orders and took three spears and stuck it into Absalom's heart and killed him. And it says they buried him there in a deep pit in the forest and they piled a large amount of rocks upon him. So the rebellion was put down and David returned to Jerusalem as king but then he mourned the loss of his son greatly. And no doubt mourned over all that had happened. Why? Because of the sin of his life that had set this chain of events in motion. But that's, that's for a whole nother Sunday <laughs> and another set of psalms. Let me just summarize some of what we learned this morning and then we'll wrap up. Consider these thoughts again. How do you respond when your life starts to unravel? How do you respond when adversaries rise up against you? Do you respond in the flesh? I know you want to. Do you respond in the flesh, in your own resources, your own fortitude? Or do you appeal to the Lord for help? Is he your immediate go-to? That's such an important question. Is your prayer life persistent and honest and personal and ordered and expectant? If it is, if it is, if you're practicing those daily habits, when the hard time comes, it will be much quicker and much more natural to go to the Lord in prayer and worship. Do you ask God to act on your behalf? And can you do that as David did with a clean conscience, knowing that you are on the path of the righteous, that you're found in Jesus, you are cleansed by his blood, and you're abiding in his love? If so, go to the Lord and ask him to act on your behalf. Now, I know some of you are already discouraged by this. I know, I know it's true, right? You're like, my prayer life is awful. I'm, I'm such a, you're hanging, you're hanging your head. I'm such a failure. I don't want you to be discouraged by this. I want you to be encouraged and inspired. There is never a bad day to change some basic habits in your prayer life. And, that, and that's the whole point of the conviction of the Holy Spirit when we study the scriptures. Not to, not to destroy your spirit, but to build you up and say, yes, by the power of the Holy Spirit, I can grow in this. So be encouraged by this. I want to close with one last psalm a passage from Psalm 4, and I'll put it up on the screen. This is, this is, this is David, and the way I interpret this, David is, David is now speaking to his own heart in the middle of Psalm 4. I think it's very interesting. And he says, tremble and do not sin. Now, another way to say that is, you know what? Be frustrated. Be perturbed. Be angry about this fallen world we live in, but do not sin. And that is such an important thing. Listen, when we're faced with trouble and a storm is brewing or people are starting to, to treat us poorly, we are in the grip of a great temptation to get angry and to lash out and destroy our witness. But David counsels us, don't do it. Don't do it. Do not sin. He says, instead, meditate in your heart upon your bed and be still. Let God fight your battles. Be still. As you lay down to sleep in those crucial moments when you're tempted to be anxious, recall God's promises to you in that moment. Meditate on his word. What does God say about himself? What does he say about you as his child? Meditate on those things and be still. Take that deep breath. Lay your head down and let the peace of Christ rule your heart. And then the last verse. Offer the sacrifices of righteousness and trust in the Lord. At the end of the day, trust in, in the Lord. In those critical moments of failure and stress, draw near to God. Reaffirm your trust in Him. Tell Him. He has things under control, right? And in His timing and in His way, He will work all things together for your good. 
So make it a point of prayer to be confident in these things, just like David was. Amen? I want you to bow your heads. Let's close our eyes. And together, we're going to wrap up by praying some of these psalms. And as we do this, listen, I know it's tempting at the end of the sermon. You're tired. I've just worn you out. And you're like, okay, checkbox. we got to pray at the end. Make this personal. As I say these words, make it personal. Make it passionate in your heart to agree with these things. You ready? Let's do this. Father, we thank you for, first of all, the ability to just come into your presence as your children, to know that you long to hear from us. You long to commune with us. And so, Lord, we thank you for being gracious to us. We thank you for always condescending to listen to us and to hear our prayers. Father, will you help us to be quicker to come to you rather than trust in ourselves? Lord, we want to grow in faith. We want to, we want to grow in, in grasping the truth that you are our greatest help, that you are our shield and our glory. Help us to do that, Lord. Oh, Lord, lift up our heads. Protect us from any sense of hopelessness that might come from the enemy against our hearts. Lift up our heads, Lord. Father, give us restful sleep at night as we learn to entrust ourselves more and more into your loving care. Give us that peace that we need, Lord. Father, remove any fears that we're experiencing right now. Grant us your supernatural peace that we need so badly. God, increase the gladness in our hearts for all that you have provided for us, all the ways that you have blessed us, things that we might have taken for granted, Lord, but recognize come from your gracious hand. And most of all, Lord, thank you for saving us. Thank you that you have delivered us in spite of ourselves. Like David, we, we are sinful creatures, but you have washed us clean by the blood of Christ and you have saved us. We praise your name for that this morning. And now, Jesus, even as we we come and we sing and we worship. Lord, may the meditations of our heart be pleasing in your sight. May we sing from the depths of our heart because of how thankful we are for you. Help us to do that now, Lord. In your name we pray, amen.